And if you can have a real-time understanding of all the processes in your body, you just, for example, swipe with your phone on your arm to, to get your lactic acid level, to get your testosterone. Google and Facebook, they know so much about us because of our online behaviors. We as consumers and individuals, we have no say because we are so powerless in relation to all these big entities. Look how fast smartphones have spread to the world. More people access the internet by use of smartphones than uh, computers. At the heart of what I want to convey to the world is really a positive, optimistic interest in what awaits us. You are listening to the Optimal Performance Podcast. The OPP is brought to you by Natural Stacks, makers of 100% natural and open source supplements designed to help you live optimal. For more information on how to build optimal mental and physical performance into your life, visit naturalstacks.com. Brian Muncy is probably the smartest guy I know. Trust me, Muncy is the nutrition guy. Ryan Muncy's out there trying to make the world better for all of us. The Optimal Performance Podcast is bold, edgy, creative, entertaining, and epic. Ryan Muncy is my go-to guy. Ryan Muncy is he's the first guy I call. He's making people's lives better. Ryan Muncy's an innovator. All right, guys, welcome back to the OPP. As always, I appreciate you being here, sharing some time with us. Uh, really pumped to bring you today's episode. Our guest is Hans Job. Uh, Hans is the Chief Disruption Officer. How cool is that title? I mean, my title with Natural Stacks is Chief Optimizer. I think Hans has me beat. He's the Chief Disruption Officer at the Epicenter Stockholm. Um, Epicenter is a co-working space. To call it that is such an understatement and and disgrace to what it really is. Uh, But the Epicenter was actually the host for the Biohacker Summit, where I uh, was fortunate enough to not only attend, but be able to contribute and speak back in May. And I met Hans. Uh, He was one of the opening keynote speakers. They talked about implants. And I learned that most of the members at the Epicenter actually have chips implanted that give them access to the building. Uh, so instead of using a key or a key card or, or a code or anything like that, uh, you know, this is really on the cutting edge of all this biohacking stuff. And, and Hans is really big into implants, um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, technology, as you will see and hear in our discussion today. Um, he is also on the faculty at Singularity University, which is uh, founded by uh, the brilliant man, Ray Kurzweil. And if you haven't heard of Ray, definitely check him out. We'll have links to uh, Singularity University, uh, Epicenter, all this stuff on the blog post for this podcast. So as always, go to naturalstacks.com. You'll be able to see that. I want to uh, start with a quote from Ray Kurzweil, the founder of Singularity University. And, and the quote is, few observers have truly internalized the implications of the fact that the rate of change itself is accelerating. So with all of this machine learning, artificial intelligence, biohacking, transhumanism, we are rapidly approaching the horizon. Obviously the horizon always moves forward, but you know, I think we really need to start thinking now. And, and as you'll hear, a lot of the leaders who are on the front line of innovation are already having these conversations. But as consumers, as end users, we need to really start paying attention to you know, what we're opting into uh, and what future we're curating for ourselves. So, you know, I will play skeptic on this episode uh, in my head. You know, I can I can envision all those Hollywood movies, Gattaca, Robocop, things like that, where you know you have a society that is controlled by technology, and um, you know the the powers that be can kind of keep tabs on them and, and direct them. And uh, I recently saw 1984 on Broadway, so you know I have that kind of I'm scared of Big Brother and big data thing uh, sort of in the back of my head. So uh, I'm grateful for Hans for coming on the show and sort of um, entertaining my 
line of questioning, uh, but also providing us, you know, his perspective on the the upside, the optimistic look of, you know, where we can go with this, what we can do. Uh, and as you'll hear from Hans, there's some really, really cool things that can be done uh, with implants and, you know, sort of the, the marriage of technology and biohacking and all this stuff. So um, enjoy this one. Love to hear your thoughts on this. Uh, you know, how do we make sure that this goes in the right direction and that we use it for all the right things and uh, all of the amazing opportunities that do exist out there for us with this technology? Uh, so that said, uh, remember, go to naturalstacks.com. You'll be able to see the blog post uh, along with links and resources for this show. Go to iTunes, leave us a five-star review. Let us know how much you like the show. When we read your review on the air, we will hook you up with free Natural Stacks products. Uh, all you have to do is email me, ryan, at naturalstacks.com when you hear your review, and we'll get you a care package out. Um, and finally, share the OPP with the people in your life who you know will benefit from and enjoy the things that we're talking about and we're doing here. That's how we help new people. That's how we reach more people and move this whole thing forward. And that's what this is all about. Uh, so today's review is from Ben Tech Morris. Uh, this was actually on Instagram, uh, but Ben, uh, actually Twitter tweeted, good brain and mind knowledge dropped by Ryan Muncy about mindset and building your neural network. Uh, that was following the show that we had with Andy Murphy. Uh, that one came out last week. If you haven't checked that one out, definitely go back and listen to that one. Andy was an amazing guest. And that podcast is full of awesome information. So, Mr. Ben, thank you for that review. Shoot me an email and we'll hook you up with some goodies. All right, guys, enjoy this episode with Hans. Hans, my friend, welcome to the OPP. Wonderful to be here with you guys. Thanks, Ryan, for having me. Oh, it's our pleasure. Thank you for, for being here and, and sharing your time and your expertise with us today. Speaking of expertise, you are the chief disruption officer at the epicenter in Stockholm, Sweden. Uh, so on a daily basis, you get to sort of live at the intersection of biotech and biohacking and artificial intelligence. Tell us a little bit about uh, your day job and, and what you do on a daily basis. Right, sure. So yeah, I have a day job, so to say. Uh, and in, in this role at Epicenter, which is a, an innovation hub, a co-working space, and also a, a hotbed for testing new ideas and do uh, practical innovation in Stockholm, um, is that I host events, hackathons, workshops, and one of my favorite um, activities, which is what we call digital safaris, where uh, companies or groups of people can come and experience new tech hands-on so this is uh, part of my job description is to look for the latest and uh, most spectacular in terms of tech try it on myself first and then uh, tell others about it beautiful um so one of the things you said there is something that that i really respect about you we, we talked about this uh, a lot uh, together when i was over there for the biohacker summit and, and you know this is something that we both practice that we kind of view ourselves as laboratories um you know we don't it's not enough for for either of us to hear or, or learn about something you know we we want to experience it we want to feel it we want to try it on ourselves and see you know how it feels how it affects us um I agree, Ryan. So this is all about, for me, the biohacker ethic. So uh, you can't really talk about it until you've tried yourself. And also someone tells you this worked great for me, but it may not mean that it works for someone else. So you don't know until you have really tried it. No, yeah, absolutely. So uh, speaking of these digital safaris, what are like, I guess when, when people come to these things, what, what kind of stuff are they learning? What are, what are some of the, like the biggest things people want to know? Uh, so we have probably 30, 40 different sort of stations that I can set up and I tailor them normally to different audiences depending on which type of company or group that is coming. But typically we will uh, do something about virtual reality where people can experience these things. We have augmented reality, headsets and experiences, telepresence robots, uh, chip implants, uh, DNA testing kits uh, and all kinds of sort of uh, human machine interaction wearables like myo wristbands or similar items. 
Now, one of the things that really, really struck me when I was over there and, and got to see Epicenter, uh, your members are chipped. Yeah, talk, true. T- talk a little bit about that. So uh, we, um, when we set up Epicenter, I was part of the team that uh, set up Epicenter back in 2015. And since at the same time, we were a group of biohackers in Sweden experimenting with chip implants. And then we just made sure to set up the entire infrastructure of the office uh, so that we could operate uh, everything from doors to uh, conference room booking systems to copying machines and all different types of access by using our chip implants. So, I mean, the implants that we have, they use an existing communication standard, which is uh, MyFair Ultralight. And there are lots of different readers that are compatible with them. So it wasn't that hard. And because we set up the space this way, a lot of our members have found it very practical to uh, get a chip implant instead of having uh, key fobs or badges to access the facilities and open their lockers, et cetera. Well, you never have to worry about forgetting your your combination or, or losing your key, leaving it at home. How big is the chip and does it hurt to have it implanted? The chip is about the size of a grain of rice. Uh, and this is a technology that we put in animals for industrially for, for decades already. So we know that this is a safe technology. It's not particularly harmful to the body. And uh, we know how it works inside you know, a living organism. Uh, I think the chip implant is a beautiful illustration of exactly what biohacking is all about. Because we as biohackers, we didn't exactly invent the chip implant technology, but we hacked it because we we said, okay, so here's an implant that you stick in cats so they can go through cat flaps. Hmm, interesting. What happens if I stick it in my own hand? So I, you know where I'm going to go with this now because you and I sort of had this debate uh, previously. And I sent, I tend to be a little bit more on the skeptical side of uh, chips and, and sort of the future of, of you know, human uh, yeah, you always come off as a late adopter, right? <laughs> <laughs> and and you, you are certainly on the, uh, the optimistic side. Let's, let's put it that way. Um, I, I think to, if, if I'm going to play skeptic here, you know, I envision the chips as, you know, I, I'm hesitant to uh, adopt that or be an adapter because, you know, I envision, you know, sort of the Hollywood, sci-fi futuristic movie of like a Gattaca or something like that, where, um, you know, when you watch that movie, you're like, okay, how did, how did it get here? How did people let this happen? And when I look at big data and wearables and chips, I see us actually opting into that. I know you don't quite see it that way. So dispel my skepticism and sort of talk to our listeners about where uh, on the on the positive side we could see the future of this going yes ryan ryan so you your brain is too full of hollywood narratives <laughs> and i travel and i do a fair bit of talks on tech and sometimes i like to start out with showing pictures of, of all these powerful Hollywood movies that have really shaped our view of the future. I mean, Terminator and Gattaca, you mentioned, Minority Report, Robocop and The Matrix. I mean, whenever you talk about future tech and AI and implants, you get these thrown back at you. Uh But I'd like to say that, hey guys, please forget all these Hollywood stories because we know that Hollywood, they make movies to sell. And of course, they make them a bit overly dramatic. And if you make a movie about the future where everything is great, <laughs> you know, it, it won't be at, as exciting. But have a look at tech in the real world and um, what technology really has given us in the last hundred years is that it's made us healthier than ever. It's made us better educated than ever. It's made us better traveled. And we simply have a much, much greater understanding of the world because that we use better technology uh, today than we did a few generations back. So with this in perspective, I'm not that afraid of new technologies. In fact, I think that we will find more positive ways to use them than negative ones. Um, So uh, don't put too much of your faith in Hollywood. (laughs) Look at the real world. The other point I'd like to make around the implants is that 
yeah, I see some frightening aspects of implant technology as well. Of course, we have the tracking, and you know, if if there were ever was sort of a government program to compulsory implant people, I'd be the the first guy on the barricades to fight it. But for me, the good thing here is that if we as biohackers, in open source fashion, sort of share all the information we have. Uh, Anybody can participate. You do it on a voluntary, informed basis. If we explore implant technology in this fashion, it's much, much better than if it comes by the way of big corporates suddenly pushing it down our throats by way of massive marketing. So my idea about biohacking is that you there are two reasons why you need to understand new technologies and the first one is of course to use them and find new exciting ways to use them but the second aspect is of course to understand if it's being used against you and in order to do that you need to understand how it works and this is why i encourage people to experiment with implant technology as well as for example with dna hacking because we need to know how this works and we need to know what our boss or you know, the government can do if they have our DNA or if they have our implant uh, data. And the only way to do that is to be ahead of the curve uh, compared to them. Yeah, so so there's two ways we can go with this. And, and I definitely want to ask you both of these questions. Um, I'm trying to figure out in my head which one's the best to ask you first. But I guess since we're sort of talking about potential negatives, how do we guard against uh, the unethical use of, of this data? Uh, because, I mean, it, it is certainly being compiled. It is out there. And, uh, you know, if we wanted to look at, you know, big brother and big data. Um, Do you mean the general? Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Well, it's just in, in, you know, in, in general terms, I mean, there's there's a lot of information about all of us that's already out there. But if we were to get these chips, um, you know, and, and they're going to be used for good, um, you know, how do we protect, you know, that data? Right. So, I mean, the problem is not new and not specifically related to implants, of course. We, we, I'd say that we are already massively tracked. And I think the three biggest culprits here are, uh, number one, it's our smartphones, because our uh, mobile operators, they know exactly where we are. They know who we talk to. They know who our friends are. Uh, and the second one is, of course, our browsers. So Google and Facebook, they know so much about us because of our online behaviors, what we search for, whom we relate to. Uh, and the third is, of course, uh, the banks and our payment cards that know everything we buy, where we bought it, how much we spend, how much we earn. So we are already massively mapped. And I think that as a biohacker, again, and as a hacker, that this is fundamentally unfair. Uh, we, we as consumers and individuals, we have no say because we are so powerless in relation to all these big entities. But for me, technology is sort of the, the potential equalizer here. And by understanding technology and how it's being used against us, we can perhaps, like a, a judo wrestler, use the, the force of direction to them and divert it in a different way so that you know it doesn't harm us for example by using multiple identities online by using anonymous browsing by um, enable uh, sort of disenabling certain functions on your smartphone to to make it a lot harder to track your location i mean these things a lot that they just do what would by those, default. Uh, what what should we disable on our smartphone well, it depends on how paranoid you are. <laughs> let's, assume, let's, let's assume high-level paranoia. Well, uh, Edward Snowden, you know that it's quite easy for someone uh, externally to turn on the microphones of your phone. So you bring your smartphone into uh, a meeting, uh, you turn it off or you put it on mute. But it's not that hard for someone who has access to it to actually uh, listen through the microphones. So Edward Snowden has the beautiful movie where he opens a smartphone and he physically removes the uh, microphones from inside the phone. There are three uh, microphones in, in standard uh, smartphones, current smartphones. And the good thing with this, then you know nobody can listen. And if you want to talk, you just plug in a, head, a hands-free. So then you have control over the microphone. And it 
no, this for me is a, perhaps a good hack if you work with human rights or uh, related matters in a country where you know governments are not that conductive to those kind of activities. Mm-hmm. So, uh, are you saying it's not enough then to just put your phone on airplane mode? Oh, definitely not. Not if you're, let's say you're working with human rights in China or Russia, then definitely that's not enough. Wow. Okay. Okay. Um, so then with the chips, I mean, is it, is it possible to encrypt, uh, the data that's on the chips? Right. Back to the chip implants. So, um, the current generation of chip implants are, as stupid as key fobs, really. So they they can they're passive. They don't have a battery. They cannot transmit any information uh, by themselves. They can only sort of wake up when they are touched by a smartphone or a door reader, and then they transmit their information. But we can easily imagine you and I that in a not particularly distant future, we will have implants that uh, have a battery that have uh, the capacity to transmit information independently. And then I think we need to have much greater concern about then it, what kind of data we share and how it's shared. But I would not say that it's fundamentally different from what we're already doing, for example, with fitness wearables. So compare it to a Fitbit, uh, you wear it and what kind of information you share. Ultimately, it's about trusting uh, the, the company uh, or the entity that collects your data. And here there are some interesting options because it's very different in different jurisdictions. So for example, in Germany and Switzerland has the best privacy laws in the world. So I'd much rather trust a a German company over a British company, for example, with my personal health data. Okay. Um, So uh, how far in the future are we looking uh, would, how i mean how long until we can expect to see some of these things right so um the health logging implants are there are already implants that measure certain biometrics in the market uh, many of them are developed for veterinary uses and have been tested in animals already for years you have temperature measuring measuring implants you have implants that can measure pulse uh, and there are also uh, med tech implants that you can measure blood sugar. For example, there's a company called Sensonics, uh, which has uh, developed a, uh, an implant, a glucose measuring implant for people with diabetes. Now, the weakness with this implant is that it's limited to 90 days use uh, because there is a certain uh, building up of biofilm on the sensors, so uh, which is uh, why you remove it after about three months and you have to put in a new one. But if you compare this to poking a needle through your skin 10 times a day, uh, I would still consider it a win. Mm-hmm. And uh, I also foresee that these things are tested f- uh, for people with different medical conditions, but over time, of course, these implants will be something that will be interested also, interesting also for the mass market, for guys like you and me who are interested in fitness. And, I think this technology has the potential to really transform how we view health. Yeah, and I guess, I mean, that leads me to sort of the next question. Okay, let's let's say in one year or three years, uh, however long it might take to have this ideal implant. Like, I, I think that would be fascinating and, and an amazing future where we have this implant that gives us real-time feedback um, and can help us modify our behaviors based on, you know, what our blood sugar looks like or, um, you know, any of those biometrics. I I don't think that a lot of people are are really aware of that potential. I think it would be an absolutely transformative technology. And I, as far as I can see, technologically, we can build these things. So there are a few small hurdles, the main one being battery and also designing a a smooth user experience, but sensor-wise, we can stick all the sensors we want into uh, a, an implant, which is the size of a grain of rice, and we can. It takes two seconds to inject it under the skin, and it takes ten seconds to remove it. So it's not that 
big an affair, really. And once we have this technology, and as you say, Ryan, if you can have a real-time understanding of all the processes in your body, you just, for example, swipe with your phone on your arm to, to get your lactic acid level, to get your testosterone, to, to see how exercise is affecting your body, uh, it will give you much, much deeper insights. And I think there are benefits, different benefits for different groups. For those of us who are interested in fitness, we can optimize exercise and nutrition. For people with you know, potential health conditions, there can be an early warning system. Okay, we see your heart rate pattern is changing. We can see your cholesterol level is changing over time. Maybe you need to consult a doctor before it goes bad. This technology will save a lot of lives, and not just in developed rich countries, but we can easily imagine a village in South Asia where you know their, their nearest doctor lives two days travel away. And now if someone has an implant uh, and in the village and they get ill, there only needs to be a single smartphone in that village to, to get uh, you know, to diagnose what's happening to the person. And it will, you know, bring tremendous health benefits also to to the poorer uh, people on this planet. We need this the most. That, that's just, it's so fascinating to me. And you think that's two or three years away, five years away, 10 years? Te- technologically, I, I think this is two, three years away for it to be mass market, uh, trickier to say, but... Ultimately, these things, they need not be particularly expensive. And maybe I shouldn't say this, but if some company builds this in, in the West, I'll be very happy to hack it to make it available <laughs> <laughs> to a lot more people on this planet who really need it, but may not be able to afford it. So, uh, do, you, do you have that kind of hacking skill? You don't have to answer. You can you can plead the fifth. You don't have to answer that question. Exactly. <laughs> well, let's say there are many brilliant technologists in the biohacker movement, and we we don't work individually. We we work in. All right. So then that, that does bring up the next question. Um, you know, how do we handle that data? And and you know, the infrastructure of uh, you know, you and I had this conversation previously, where you know the. Your, your wife is a nurse. My wife is a doctor. You and I are both intimately aware of, you know, how archaic um, the medical systems are in terms of processing information. And, you know, the, the bottleneck for, for treating people is, is processing the data, um, you know, not necessarily um, getting to the patients. So I, I guess, you know, how, how is that circumvented with this? I mean, would would this technology have to, would it force the medical orthodoxy to change or would it completely decentralize medicine and treatment? I think it would both centralize and decentralize certain functions and keep in mind that countries are very different. In Sweden, we have a well-developed, I mean, social healthcare system, which is free for citizens here. In many countries, there is very little of that infrastructure. And I think that the current model of hospitals that we have in developed economies is based on the industrial society model. So a hospital, you know, you fall ill, you go there for a few days, they cure you, and then you go home. But this model doesn't work for a lot of people because perhaps most importantly, we need to be much better at preventing things from occurring or detecting them a lot earlier before people fall in. And this is where I think that this implant technology, but already wearable technologies and at home type simple labs where you can swipe yourself to, you know, there has been some interesting Kickstarter projects for these little home test labs. And this will democratize healthcare access a lot. And it means that people may not even have to go to hospitals because you can address things a lot earlier. And then again, there will always be hospitals for more advanced diseases, but we, we will perhaps have very different ways to access them because we will have implants that transmit data in real time. We are monitored by smart 
and loving algorithms, watched over by machines of love and grace, as the poem goes, that will help take care of us. So I'm thinking a little bit less big brother and a little bit more big sister. A nice, sweet nurse that sort of watches my health. And this is perhaps what we should envision when we create those implants. I, I mean, again, I, I can't help but fall back sort of on the, the skeptic side. I mean, how do we how do we prevent that from going into a, sort of a dark and gloomy scenario? How do we make sure that it stays sweet and, you know, protective and comforting as opposed to the opposite? OK, so uh, let's think of encryption possibilities, for example, for implants. So I think this needs to be built in. And um, there are already excellent systems for you know, encrypting data, allowing individuals to keep much greater control of the data we have and the data we share. Uh, so this, for me, would be a, a first line of defense, really. So by encrypting data, you can choose who can access your data, and not, as today, by default, that's sort of free and you have zero control over it. Secondly, I think choice of jurisdiction is very important. As I said earlier, to I think it's a serious competitive advantage for a company to be uh, have its legal home in Switzerland compared to, uh, for example, UK or US in terms of data privacy and integrity. So uh, this is something that we should look at and shop for when mm -hmm. that day comes. Um, then you can also do, as I do, you can register on many of these platforms using alternative identities. Uh, again, a bit on the paranoid side, but um, if you do gene testing, you know it's quite easy to to have a you know, separate this from your normal life uh, and and the data you you can access by uh, some different logins, different email accounts, or different browsers or different hardware. Uh, so that it cannot be connected to other parts of your life. Okay. So there are a few practical suggestions for data, for keeping control of your data. Yeah. So is this sort of what the intersection of biohacking and artificial intelligence looks like, or, or is there something else that you envision? I definitely see this uh, artificial intelligence in terms of a personal health monitoring assistant. We can call her big sister or perhaps a guardian angel. Uh, yeah, th that is a very concrete application of biohacking and AI. Okay. That I, I, I'm sure we'll see. Okay, so then uh, it, let's just say that that happens. Um, I mean, that's going to create some sort of, I don't want to say cyborg, but okay, let's call it like superhuman right mm -hmm. um that will elevate a certain percentage of people a, a certain amount by definition the humans without that will be a tier lower like how do we how do we prevent that uh inferior race of humans from happening i'm not, i'm not particularly worried about this potential splitting of humanity, uh, Ryan. So, because what I see is a trend of technology really becoming democratized, especially good technology. Look how fast smartphones have spread to the world. More mm. people access the internet by use of smartphones than uh, uh, computers nowadays. And we have a global online population of, I think, about two and a half billion people and we're about to add another two billion in the coming five to six years and most of these new users will be using just smartphones and these uh, 10 years ago the iphone was launched just about 10 years ago smartphones didn't exist more than 10 years ago and now it's already spread to billions and billions of people so smart technology is being democratized faster than ever let's say we create a kick-ass implant connected to a super smart uh, AI that you know understands the deep patterns of health data. How much will it cost to make one more copy of that AI? 
in reality, it will cost nothing. So of course we can share them with the world. I, th I think that this will be great positive healthcare technology like that will be rapidly democratized to anyone who wants it, just like smartphones, but faster. Do you think that whoever cracks that code would be benevolent and willing to share it and distribute it for free and not to do it for profit? Because I mean, isn't that... I'm sure there will be both. So I'm sure there will be some guys who do it for profit, but I'm also sure there will be some guys who do it open source. I mean, if, if it's not done as open source, there will be a lot of people who struggle to get their hands on it. Yeah, but then again, building in smart algorithms that can map health data is not ultimately overwhelmingly complicated, right? If one of my favorite books is Kevin Kelly's What Technology Wants, where he beautifully illustrates that most tech innovations, we think it's done by geniuses who deep, deep dive into a subject, but it turns out that most innovations and most new things that are found are actually found by a number of people independently. For example, different uh, uh, technical innovations, they, they happen in five places in the course of two years independent of each other mm -hmm. because the technology is mature for it. And look at operating systems. Yes, we have iOS and we have Windows, but we also have Linux. And I mean, they are all supported by different communities. And I, I think we will have a very similar development with AI. So there will be some large corporations, but there will also be a strong open source uh, community. Okay. All right. Now, I mentioned this uh, before we hit record with you, uh, mentioned it in your bio that uh, you are on the faculty at Singularity University. Uh, tell us a little bit about how your involvement there has kind of shaped some of what you're into as well. Absolutely. So I attended Singularity University in 2010. So I was there in the early days. And for me, Singularity University was absolutely transformative. It's, I've been a, very interested in tech and sci-fi and future stuff all of my life. But when I attended Singularity, it was really, it opened my eyes and I connected the dots in a very interesting way because I realized that the whole transformation that we're seeing, all this, you know, you read a newspaper or you watch TV and you see oh, self-driving cars here and, you know, hacking mammoths there. And suddenly all this was tied together and it started to make sense because it's all driven by these exponentially advancing technologies and in particular, the advances in computing. So because computing is becoming, uh, how do I put it? Computing is simply, whenever we have a problem, we can just throw computing power at it in, a, in an unprecedented way historically. It used to be the case that we had to throw human brains at the problem, but now we can throw massive supercomputers into solving problems instead. And this means that we have these very, very rapid advances. And my field, the faculty that I'm connected with at Singularity University is digital biology. And we like to say that um, digital biology is really the new IT. And we now have the tools to program the code of life. And sometimes you hear this conversation, we need to teach the kids more programming, they need to be taught, you know, software development in schools. But I say, yeah, we need to have good developers in school, but they shouldn't be programming computers. They shouldn't be doing Java and HTML5. They should learn DNA hacking, DNA programming. Because in a few years, when kids in school today are coming out in the labor market, this is the skill that we will be asking for. And once we can start to program the code of life, we can do marvelous things, and we already are. Cure diseases, we can create more nutritious food, we can uh, even begin to modify ourselves genetically. So, I mean, where do you draw the line ethically on that? I think the ethics is, uh, it's individual. I think that we, 
we today have the technology to cure heritable genetic diseases. Right. Yet we allow children to be born with these terrible, debilitating, lethal diseases. I think it's immoral not to use the technology we have to cure these things. It's like your neighbor's house is on fire, you have a a garden hose, and you're not coming to help them. So uh, I think we're moving way too slow in terms of how we explore and experiment the applications of uh, DNA uh, modification on uh, living organisms, including Homo sapiens. And when you say DNA hacking, is, is, is there an application beyond just preventing debilitating diseases, you know, before birth? I mean, what other applications do you see for that? There are a number of applications in uh, genetic technology. You can, for example, um, think of viruses to modify the immune system in ways like uh, we do today with vaccines, but in different ways. So we can uh, prevent bodies from getting diseases. We can also, Andrew Hessel, which is part of the faculty at Singularity University, he likes to talk about viruses as apps for the body. For example, the human body doesn't have the capacity to synthesize its own vitamin C. Most large mammals, for example, horses, they create their own vitamin C as part of their uh, metabolism. But we humans somewhere lost that ability, so which means that if we don't eat vitamin C, we get scurvy. Now, we, this for me would be something that we perhaps should, should modify genetically on ourselves so that we can again synthesize vitamin C and we will never again run the risk of, of having a deficiency in vitamin C. But... There are perhaps deeper things. You can look at stem cell therapy. You can look at uh, bone marrow transplants, for example, which where we are already applying since a number of years uh, genetic modification technologies to uh, to save lives for people who have uh, leukemia, for example, who are under cancer treatment, and whom you can give healthy and genetically modified uh, bone marrow uh, back. So. Uh, and if you take it further, you can perhaps envision that the human tree, I mean, we are today we are one human species, Homo sapiens. There used to be a number of other species of hominids. We have the Homo erectus and Homo florensis and Homo neanderthalensis. And perhaps we are on the brink of a new species radiation of hominids, where we will see a number of new types of humans walk this planet and hopefully also other planets. Uh, so I think this is a wonderful future that we're looking into. All right. That, that's some uh, fascinating uh, stuff and, and plenty for us to think about and meditate on there. Um, let's, let's lighten it up a little bit. We'll shift gears. Uh, what's the best advice you've ever been given, Hans? Well, I'd like to come back to the idea of don't trust what others people say. Try for yourself. Yeah. Again, I think I, this was something that I learned young and I applied throughout life, but I, I've never seen a better community doing it than the biohackers. Because yes, you read and it worked. This exercise worked great for these guys, but does it work for me? I won't know until I've tried. Yeah. All right. I, I love it. I think that's great advice. Uh, it's definitely something that you and I, we've talked about that before. We, we both firmly believe that and we do it with everything. Um, you mentioned uh, Kevin Kelly's uh, What Technology Wants. Give me uh, or give us one or two other books you've read in the last year. Right. So I, if you're interested in these ideas about where we as a species or as a civilization are heading, I think the book Homo Deus by Yuval Noah Harari is worth a read. It's a bit philosophical, it's a lot of history, but it has some very powerful and interesting ideas. Um, for those of us who are also 
biohackers who want to optimize our health, uh, nutrition, exercise. I think the biohackers handbook is something I often come back to and I read in. It's written by a bunch of biohackers in Finland who have really gotten into the serious science of these things. Mm -hmm. It's a great, great biohacking community in the, the Finns. They are really hardcore. <laughs> uh, yeah. A lot and, of saunas, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a great book. And, and we've had um, both Timu and Ali uh, on the show yeah. uh, before. And, and then Yako is their, their third counterpart to writing that. That's a very well done book. And um, it, it's beautifully compiled put together uh the illustrations and yeah, it, it's it's a great book so we'll link to all of those for you guys in the show notes um hans if our listeners want more of you where can they find you and and all of your alter egos online um please connect with me uh on uh, facebook linkedin or twitter uh, i'm happy to engage in these conversations on, on all these platforms and uh, I, I do a fair bit of travel and I do talks. And of course, we are still humans and we live in the meat space. And uh, it's uh, always a pleasure to meet people live, even if you've been acquaintances online. So uh, catch me if I'm in your area. And Twitter is, uh, it's just H-S-J-O-B, correct? Yes, I'm H-S-J-O-B. Okay. So we'll put a link to that on the show notes. You mentioned that, that you speak all over the world. If you could only give one final talk, what would your parting talk be? Great question, Ryan. I um, It's tricky when you work with forecasting the future because two years later, the stuff you said doesn't sound that cool. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So, uh, either, either you mean, find out that it's like way, way, way off, or it yeah, happened in six months. And it was kind of boring. So, right. yeah, so it's tricky. I mean, the, the field that I'm in is it's not ideal for giving final talks. I'd rather stay in the conversations for as long as I can and keep updating the insights based on, on, on new data. Um, so yeah, that's my answer. To okay, so so I'm not going to let you off the hook with that. Let's let's I'll rephrase the question. And so instead of one final talk, I guess what would be sort of like a guiding principle to uh, sort of stay evergreen? Then with your kind of thoughts on uh, transhumanism and and you know future right. Good. So at the heart of what I want to convey to the world is really positive, optimistic interest in what awaits us. Because I honestly think that we are going into the most beautiful age of mankind, where we will have an abundance of information, of, of energy, and we will be healthier and live longer and have greater experience than any generation before us. And it's easy to feel a bit of doom and gloom when you watch the evening news, but I think we should not fear the future, but we should really see that we, even as individuals, we have extremely powerful tools in our hands today, such as, for example, DNA modification technology, that we can really create the future. We are not passive passengers in history any longer. We can be agents and we can really help create. And I think that is the most amazing time to be alive. And I'm so happy to, to be. That was beautiful, Hans. That was beautiful. <laughs> All right. Final question. We want to know your top three tips to live optimal. Right. So um, a few practical life hacks for me. Um, well, if you can adjust your sleep cycle so you don't need an alarm clock, that is an awesome life hack. Um, the worst way to start a day is that <laughs> bloody alarm bell going off <laughs> when you're in the middle of a good dream or a deep sleep. Yeah. So if you can plan your 
your work schedule and lifestyle so that you wake up by yourself every morning. I've done this for the last few years and I think it brings much happier days. Uh, again, speaking of sleep, which I think is so important, we, we experiment with nootropics and we do our caffeine and, and many things, but the greatest cognitive enhancer of all is, of course, sleep. If you don't get enough sleep, the brain, you know, no coffee in the world will help you, as we all know. So a hack that I have developed over a number of years in, and I, I worked as a management consultant for a number of years. I also worked in finance in London with very, very long hours for a number of years. And is that to, to run a, a sleep cycle that I have developed where I can go for two nights in a row with very little sleep, say three, four hours, and then sleep properly for the third night. And that I can do pretty much indefinitely. Um, but to go for a number of nights without enough sleep, it's very hard, but if you just take a good sleep every third night, then it works very well. For you. I think that's a, a fascinating example of exactly what we've talked about already on the show is, you know, you've got to experiment and find what works best for you. Uh, yeah, exactly. That, that protocol may not work for, for everyone, but, you know, somebody else may find that like, hey, that's, that's brilliant. I, I wish I'd known about that three years ago. I hope, yeah, let me know if it works for you, someone out there. Um, yeah, I think those were my main contributions. All right, so you got sleep, you got the, we'll give you sleep and the sleep hack. Let's give us yeah. one more. Yeah, so I'm not going to go diet because you've had so many smart people on your talks giving the best stuff there, but my third one is go barefoot. So okay. besides the alarm clock, I think shoes is just something that is to be avoided as much as we can. Now, I live in a pretty cold country, Sweden, so the barefoot season is shorter than I wish. But me and my kids, we try to walk barefoot at all times during the, the warm months. And I can just feel that uh, it affects the health of my whole body. Mm -hmm. So uh, walking barefoot outdoors, uh, and then it really hurts when you begin to put the shoes back on in September. Yeah, I, I'm I'm a big fan of wearing shoes as infrequently as possible. Uh, anybody who knows me knows I hate wearing shoes. Um, you mentioned living in Sweden. I, I, we know that you know the further we get from the equator, uh, the less direct uh, sunlight is. Do you have any um, anything that you do to optimize your vitamin D uh, levels or or your sun exposure? Oh, absolutely. So. Uh... Yes, it's a well-known fact. We, I mean, we live in almost 60 degrees northern latitude here in, in Stockholm, and it's for six months of the year, it's very dark and uh, only a few hours of sunlight. So the standard condition for most Swedes is, is vitamin D deficiency. I take uh, bi-monthly blood tests to, to track my blood sugar level, or sorry, my vitamin D level, of course. Uh, I take massive amounts of supplements. In fact, it's, it's very hard to take so much vitamin D that you get it, uh, you, it gets toxic. So I'm not worried about taking uh, very hard amounts. And even though I do that, I am all, all still in the low uh, end of the spectrum of my vitamin D. And of course, uh, if you live on these latitudes to, uh, to travel uh, to warmer places during December and January, I think for me, I've done that for the last, 10 years and it's really a survival uh, thing uh, to do. Hmm. Okay. Very interesting. All right. Uh, Hans, this has been great. We, we really appreciate your time uh, for you hey, guys. It listening. was great. Yeah. For you guys listening, go to naturalstacks.com. You'll be able to see the video version of this along with links uh, to all of the, the resources that we brought up. Uh, make sure you go to iTunes, leave us a five-star review. Let us know how much you like the show and be sure to share this episode of the OPP and the OPP in general with your friends, your family, the people in your life who you know will benefit from and enjoy the things that we are talking about here on the show. That's how we help and reach more people. Uh, Hans, thank you again for your time. If you guys want to follow up with Hans, he is at HSJOB on Twitter and we'll have all those links on the website. Thanks, Hans. 
Thank you so much for having me, Ryan. Take care out there.